So, almost 25 years ago, a uh, teacher introduced his high school computer club to this newfangled computer technology called the World Wide Web. Uh, and today, it's my honor to introduce Peter Whitehouse, longtime board member of the Queensland Society of Information Technology Educators, uh, as he considers the topic of teaching programming for the fun of IT. Thanks, Nick. Um, I, bear with me, please. This is going to be a bit of a uh, journey story, but it, there's going to be a whole lot of um, stuff that I do in class um, embedded in it, and I'm really, really nervous, and I'm not really sure why, so I'll give it, a, give it my best shot. Um, I love a language that's named after Monty Python. That's my first thing. We'll come back to Python, because this isn't really about Python. It's more about um, kids coming to terms with computational thinking and programming. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm quite proud of being a teacher. Um, I'm also an out and, pr out and proud geek. Um, we all have our own puddles of geek. Geek is power. A geek is knowledge. We know what to do with that knowledge. And some people are football geeks, and some people are rowing geeks. And I'm not quite sure what my puddle of geek is, but th I'm, I'm quite passionate about it. I have quite a breadth. Um, I'm not sure that I have a lot of depth in some of the areas that I'm broadly understanding. And that's not necessarily a problem. I'm an enthusiast, not an expert. I have been a member of the QSight board for a long time, um, really interested in sharing resources and have been in centrally involved in that for a long time. I'm also a bit of a paper folder. We'll possibly touch on that later. It wasn't always that way. Um, when I started teaching, I was a math science teacher, actually biol trained. I did um, mathematical ecology. Before uni, I'd never seen a computer at all. We weren't even allowed to use calculators. We had to use a slide rule in physics um, the maths department said calculators would, ru would ruin the planet. They were right. Um, <clears throat> but I, I remember saving up for my very first calculator, um, an insanely battery-hungry monster that did nothing. Um, and my watch does more than that does now. Um, at uni, I learnt Fortran on Mark Sense cards. That was the first time I'd ever seen computers. And you'd scribble on a deck of cards and hand it to a nerd in a coat and a week later you'd get a printout with an error on line four. <coughs> and you'd have to fix that, fix that instruction and resubmit it to the same nerd in a white coat and a week later get an error on line 24. It wasn't the way of learning programming at all, it was quite brutal. We also learned a bit of Pascal on a timeshare com terminal on a mainframe computer in a completely different co university via a network which was soon to become the internet. Um, but it was like magic to me. Um, I went into schools, I was teaching maths and science. An opportunity arose where I got interested in social maths, or as I prefer to call it, maths in space. These wonderful kids who were really dislocated from maths. And one of the units was um, programming. It was the man and mathematics program before they got all PC and realized that that was alienating half of the audience. Um, they changed it to social maths and then they realised there were social connotations and changed it to maths A because A's are better apparently. Um, but maths in space was my favourite subject and we actually had an opportunity to teach Apple Basic. We had a lab of four Apple IIs, well various bits of Apple, Apple IIs and Apple II Euro Pluses. One had an 80 column card, we knew how to live back then. Um, and we were learning Apple Basic which was really quite interesting. Then an accident happened. I called it my happy accident because the government dropped a container load of computers at my state school with no instructions, just big boxes. They filled a classroom. We lost a classroom to a box farm. It was full of Sperry computers, and they stayed there for about three weeks. No one was interested in opening them because no one knew what they were. And I said, I'll have a go, and got in there, cracked all the boxes, put the machines together, set, set up a little printing network, and from then on I was hooked. They were PCs, well, sort of PCs. They were Sperry computers. If you have any memory back that far, they were a behemoth. Um, that really does very little. But back then, that was the digital education version one, DER version one. Um, and it got computers into schools where a lot of schools didn't have them. I say that's a happy accident because of that fiddling around, I managed to fluke a new job in a private, se in private school. I actually got employed by Lord Hill as computer coordinator based on my experience of putting together PCs. <laughs> so their quality control and um, job, job um, interview wasn't obviously there. Um, what's interesting though is that that put me into another set of computers. I was 
managing microbees and set up an Apple lab and started getting into programming, got into IT education and completely abandoned science and maths um, and have never looked back. That job got me my current job at Terrace teaching IPT. Now IPT for me was a, um, an accident. Uh, I was interviewed because I had no IPT experience. I'd had computing ed computer teaching education, but no IPT education, um, no formal training in IPT. But the person who interviewed me said, do you reckon you could do it? And I said, yeah, I'll give it a go. And I got the job, which was quite interesting. I realized fairly early on that I didn't know enough, so I went to uni and did another degree to fill out the computer science knowledge that I didn't have, because I felt like I was one step ahead of the kids, and I really didn't like that feeling. Way back then, I felt I needed to know everything. I felt I needed to have the answers before the kids asked the questions. I'm much less concerned about that now. Um, during that uni course, I did a little bit of assembler language. I can still read it. I can't write it anymore. Quite a lot of C. Um, also had a look at um, some run, run, rather wonderful abstract data types, really got involved in the whole notion of structure and knowledge, and it really f fueled my interest. Our weekend changed my life. I went to a workshop with a friend from QSight, um, Michelle Williams. Some of you may know her. She did a workshop, a uh, weekend workshop, on how to weave web. Prior to that, I thought it was some magical mystery um, that was way beyond me. I thought it must be complicated because it's on this new fangled internet thingamabobby and I knew nothing about it except how to plug into it and how to get kids looking at it. I thought it must be just way too hard. In about a quarter of an hour, I was suddenly empowered and I've been webbing ever since. 1992 was when I put my first version of my online resources out and they are still live today. Um, no publisher would touch me because I wanted to go in and change it. When I had a new idea for a topic, I'd want to rewrite it there and then, and no publisher would be confident in saying, oh, sure, we'll do another print run of your book. So that, for me, provided a, a mechanism for getting resources out there. I also was empowered to play around with MUDs and MOOs and chat rooms and learning management systems. I put on a Moodle for the first time, played around with that. We've got a number of people interested in that. Um, I've done co-ed, I've done boys education only, girls education. I'm currently in a boys school, so much of what I'll talk about is couched in that experience. Although in my experience, the concepts are the same, the way you approach them are just a little bit different. Open source, a really important idea, and it came, be, came to us as very important when systems that we had in place um, went away. Our school went to a BYOD or a BYO everything model when they realized they had labs that they had to roll over in leases and they had server farms which needed constant maintenance and onboard technicians. And so our school in its infinite wisdom and glory decided let's get rid of all of that and get the kids to bring their own. I don't know that we would... Um, uh, Tim, Tim, sorry, I, I, Tim is um, a learned colleague. I work with him. He got me into Python, um, I think we would probably look at the way we did it as a school and probably suggest don't go down that path, it's a perilous path, it's both exhilarating and terrifying simultaneously. Um, that said, what it has forced us to do is think about services and ways of delivering curriculum. Services that we had relied on forever went away. We used to use Delphi and we used to use a whole lot of um, network resources and when those server farms and and network resources disappeared. We were sitting there going, like, what do we use now? Okay, we want to teach kid data, kids databases, but my room now is full of Macs, and they won't run Access. I want to teach them programming, and I'm used to Delphi, and that's a Windows-only development platform. What do I use now? And that was exhilarating and terrifying. It was a threat, but we took it on board after the initial shock and said, OK, well, this is an opportunity. Let's change up, change up. So in terms of software that we're now using, most of it is open source platform independent because we haven't got network services we can now f default on. It's got to be downloadable, configurable, and runnable by kids on their laptop, regardless of the flavor of the laptop. So we've moved to things like Scratch and Scratch-based products. Um, mentioned before, so incredibly powerful. The Digitech syllabus mentions a distinction between drag and drop programming and 
text-based programming as if there's some form of inferior step up from drag and drop to text-based programming. And I'd argue anyone who's seriously explored drag and drop realizes there's an incredible richness in drag and drop environment. And it's not a continuum. So we use App Inventor and Enchanting, which is a robot replacement for NXT. Um, as well as I use an open source program called Lazarus, which is a Windows, Windows like programming environment, which is open source Visual Pascal. I do use that primarily because I want kids to understand and worship structure. You can't write a Pascal program unless there's structure, whereas other languages are really, really relaxed in that regard. We use Arduino, we also use Python. I want to talk about the abstraction barrier, and I did some research on the term abstraction barrier, and the people in the other rooms will be talking about the notion of um, abstraction barrier in terms of creating abstract data types and layers of application. That's not what I mean at all. Programming is an abstract concept. We, as people who have had some success in programming, understand instruction leads to action. When you're learning, in learning programming, it really isn't that obvious. I take a case in point. Um, Niklaus Wirt, the guy who invented um, Pascal and Modular 2 and a bunch of other programming languages, said algorithms and data equals programs. And that doesn't really help you understand programming. It's a bit like somebody who wants to be a paper folder. And they see the dragon on the end and say, I want to learn how to do that. So they see the end point. And they maybe see the building blocks right at the beginning, but they have absolutely no idea how to put it all together in an order that makes sense. And that dragon is that piece of paper on the right-hand side. The golden rule here is just fold along the lines and a dragon emerges, yeah? That's, you got that? No, there'll be a test on that later. The, look under your seat, there's a piece of paper. Start <laughs> folding now. Well, as it turns out, that sort of bewilderment, the, oh my god, what do I do first? Where does it go? How do I do that? Is what kids experience when they're coding. And we as teachers don't understand that necessarily. We assume, look, it just makes sense. You do this, you put the variables first, you put the statements, you build a function, the function has parameters. We as programmers uh, or teachers of programming understand that, but kids, there's a barrier. And it's the barrier between, I, I call it the abstraction barrier, the I know what I want to do, but I'm not sure how to do it. And then you say, okay, here's a brand new language, let's do the exact same thing, and kids will spontaneously combust because the dear syntax that they've only just learned how to drive is suddenly turned upside down and they've got to learn a whole new command structure. Surely programming is as easy as that because that's what the textbooks say. You've got to learn sequence. You've got to do it in the right order. This followed by this followed by this. You can't make the bed by putting the doona on first. You've got to arrange the sheets underneath. Selection, you've got to be able to ask questions and depending on the answer to the question, it's one thing or another, multiple selections and so on. Iteration, modularization. Most kids go, well, what the floop is this about? I know what I want to do and what's getting in the way are the commands. I don't know what commands to do. I sort of got an idea, but it goes wrong. I'll write 50 lines of code, get an error on line four and say, this is hard. As a teacher, I think the greatest privilege is being present while a kid goes through an ah moment. An ah moment is the ah, now I know how that works. That's the internalization. The ah, yes, okay, I see where that's going. I see how to fit that in. There are variants that are wildly different. The ooh is a, wow, that's interesting. I don't know anything about it, but I would like to explore it. And often our kids don't get past that. You know, you show them a piece of code and they go, ooh, and then they blindly go off and try and do something that goes horribly wrong and then they say, how do I fix this, sir? Um, so ooh and R are related, but they're not the same. R, I think you're familiar with, yes? The missing semicolon on line five. <sighs> not knowing which dot notation to use or which part or property or method of an object to reach into and getting the wrong thing and it just going haywire. Um, and the ER is just don't know where to start. But the R moment is, I think, the most privileged moment a teacher can be part of. The ah, And you see a kid, you see the lights go on, and they've got it. And that's an absolute joy to be part of. And we see that occasionally. We often see the er and the arg, but the ah moment is often private. The thing they did at home and they finally wrestled with it and finally understand, oh, that's how an array works. Ah. So I can put something in array position number four. 
Ah, now I could use that for this. Ah, light goes on. If we're really lucky, the bulb doesn't blow. Language matters, and not all languages are the same. Languages have what I call a syntax weight. That's the amount of punctuation and extra junk you've got to throw in around the commands to get them to do stuff. Right? So I call that a syntax weight. Content obfuscation, I love the word obfuscation, basically, sorry, convention obfuscation. Oftentimes the surrounding junk hides the functionality. You can't see the wood because the, the trees are in the way. All of this extra brackety stuff and headers and footers and comment structures and all the other junk gets in the way. And vocabulary bizarrity, I think I invented the term bizar bizarrity. I don't think it's a real word, but ye God, some of the commands that we ask our kids to just roll off get more and more bizarre. So the original command might be really weird and then there might be four separate dot points that you've got to dig down to get to a particular method or property of an object. And we're expecting kids to immediately go, ah, yeah, of course that makes sense to no one ever. Python is a little bit different. Now, I'm not going to trot Python out here as the saviour of modern programming and society as we know it today, but it is a little different. In terms of syntax weight, certainly simple Python programming is very light. There's very little in terms of the weight in, of the syntax required. The convention indent makes sense. This block of, t block of stuff is indented from that thing, which means this block of stuff gets controlled by that thing. That almost makes sense. Certainly simple programming in Python is fairly easy entry level. I like the fact that it has an interface called idle. I think it's named after Eric Idle, another Python reference, yay. I like the fact that you can run Python, install it on pretty well anything, and start typing commands directly at the command line. That's interesting. So you don't have to set up a program, you don't have to do anything, you can get in there and try commands straight away. From an immediacy perspective, that's brill. How different is it from the fill out a mark sense card, give it to a geek in a coat, and wait a week to be told that you can't program? Right, the here and now, that's sort of interesting. Can you do much there? Well, yeah, kinda you can. Because there's an immediacy that allows you to start surfacing seriously interesting structure. So you can write a little program in Python. I'm, I'm hoping that you've got some experience with the notion of writing programs and interacting with them via the command line because that's really interesting. So you can build a little structure and then test to see if it's any good live before you go using it anywhere else. That's really interesting. Variables are objects. They do all sorts of fun junk. Um, we can go to an ancestor. I'm not sure if many of you in the room have ever heard of Logo. I remember teaching Logo. It's a fantastic structure, immediate feedback. Um, Seymour Papert would be rejoicing at this stage that there are still implementations of Logo or something like that around. The whole notion of getting a turtle and driving the turtle around and making graphical little patterns, that's a fairly entry, easy entry level and we're contemplating using this to introduce this to our grade, grade eights. The idea of using turtle graphics seems like a primary school event until you say, well, okay, well, let's wrap up each letter in the word PDUB as a function. And then write the whole word as a function that is running the function P, then D, then U, then B. Naturally compartmentalizing instructions, sequence matters. If you don't get it right, the letters misform, all that sort of junk. Um, in terms of readability and accessibility for things like sequence, function, that sort of stuff, I'm hoping that it's going to be successful. We don't know. We have absolutely no idea if this is going to die a thousand deaths or not because we're going to try that next term with the grade eights. But we think we've got a fairly good chance of it working. Primarily because this is sort of assignment kids can't steal. I put in context, grade tens, we actually get them to build a game in Python, a simple game in Python. And some of the kids do really, really well and keep us in the loop and get us developing and we can see their plan and we can see the code gradually coming from this horrible mess to something that works, to something that's elegant, to something that's really good. And other kids do absolutely nothing for the term and then hand in this fantastic finished product. And then 
take two words out of that code, chuck it into a Google, and you find the program they stole it from. Right? So it's really easy to steal if you haven't got structure and stuff in place as well. Entry level stuff is easy. It's a really rich language. The more I play with it, and I'll, I've prefaced this by saying I'm not an expert, I'm an enthusiast. And the more I play with Python, the more enthusiastic I get about the language. There are things I really loathe about it, and we'll come to that. But there are other parts that I think are real strengths and richness. I like the notion of a language that cares so little about type. By that I mean data type. <laughs> I come from a language um, experience base where absolutely every variable had to be tied down as to what type of data it was, how much memory it would take up, and you had to pre-plan it before you used it. And it was a revelation to write a program where suddenly you're allowed to introduce a variable when you need it. And you're allowed to, in the program, change the style of that variable completely while it's being used. Suddenly it's an integer, now it's a list with 17 variations and the list has four different types. That's cool. It suddenly starts meaning that you can think about programs and problems in a very different way. You build a general structure and then start stuffing new stuff into it. So long as you know where you put it and how you put it in there and how you get at it, that's, that's the thing. So we're doing functions and lists and all sorts of stuff. Um, this is grade 10 examples. We were working with our grade 10s. Uh, we had some real success and some real failure with our grade 10s. Um, we've been doing it now for three years, Tim. I think it's three years. Um, and it, every year we teach it, we're doing it better. This, this year we did a, a term of just plain Python, um, text-based Python. And then the second term we did a, what we called advanced Python, which we, but it, it introduced some higher order skills, file IO, um, interfacing with SQL. So there's a really interesting way of connecting it to um, SQL Lite. And that's really um, uh, syntax light. I teach PHP programming, and the amount of code you've got to wrap around all of that stuff to make it work is really horrific. But this seems to be really direct, and grade 10s understood it, which absolutely blew me away, because I would have thought they would have spontaneously combusted on compact contact with it. But they didn't. They coped. So SQL, using files, using classes. Um, my interest, and Tim will attest to this, suddenly when, I, when we started playing around with classes, suddenly I had an R moment. Because up until then I had thought, okay, Python has lists and static <laughs> variables, but that's about it. And then when we look at the idea of a class and how to do a constructor and methods and properties and suddenly there's nothing you can't do. And that's cool. And then I start thinking, well, okay, maybe I could use this in IPT as well. Because up until then, I thought, IPT needs a rich data collection. I, the syllabus sort of suggests kids have to use abstract data types and understand a whole lot of higher order programming concepts. And they could in this language. They really could. The more you look, the more you see. There are so many extensions to Python, and most of them, for me at the moment, are completely baffling. I have no doubt that over the next two days I am going to be sitting there going, what am I looking at as I'm watching sessions? Because as I said, I'm an enthusiast, I'm not an expert. And I need sort of help getting in. Once, once I have my own R moment, then I'm fine. Until then, I'm flailing wildly, drowning, certainly. It's not all plain sailing. Graphical interface in Python is, in my experience, horrible. Right, seriously horrible. I'm, I'm only speaking from personal experience, and the only thing I have had any experience with is TK Inter. This built in interface kit thing where you have these really odd calls to construct visual elements, absolute mystery meat in terms of controlling where they are, what they look like, what's on them, and how they work. And we, I have failed two years in a row trying to help kids understand how to do this. Sure, they can follow the bouncing mouse. Sure, we can reproduce exercises that the teacher has prepared earlier. But the moment the, te the kid says, now I want to do this, I'm going, ho, ho, ho. I don't know, we'll find out together. And that is both an opportunity and a threat. I'm sure there's probably other kits out there. I haven't found them yet. As I said, I'm really new in the Python, in the Python game. Um, but we do simple game type things, thinking that that will help them more generally. 
and realize that it doesn't later when they say, okay, that was cute, but now I want to do this. I want to have this button that goes here, and I want this drop layer down here, and I want this image to move across to here, and I want it to dynamically change when you click on here, and I'm helping them find their answers using Google. All right, because, I don't know, it's mystery meat to me at the moment. Many kids just assume that they should just get it, that programming should come naturally to them. And I've never met a naturally gifted programmer. I've met extraordinarily talented people that have worked really hard to understand so that there are moments go up. But I've never met a naturally gifted programmer, including young Nicky. When I taught him as a young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed little kid who had no programming, and I remember his R moments. When he suddenly saw, wow, we can do this. He, for example, using Access Basic, wrote uh, multi-user multi Dungeons and Dragons, and I didn't think that was possible. Right. Students need to be fearless. When the going gets tough, a lot of kids run away from this, and they go and choose something else rather than persist, because sometimes it can be punishing. If you don't know how to solve a problem, if you don't know where to look for an answer, if you're not confident in asking for help, programming is punishing. In some aspects, less so with Python, but I don't know that it's actually a panacea for anything. Any language creates an abstraction barrier, and if you're required to write in that language, then you've got to try and work out how the language can be working for you. I like making mistakes and will often engineer in instances where I do it in front of kids. Um, I, as an early teacher, would never even contemplate going into a lesson without an understanding of what was going to happen and exactly how it should be solved and weighed up balanced solutions in terms of what's the best, what's the worst. These days, I am relatively fearless. We have to help kids understand that the path towards an elegant solution starts with a functional one. Get something working first. Certainly we've seen students that code hundreds of lines of code before they try and check to see if there are any errors. They try to solve the problems of the world before they've even got tiny little bits of their system working. So we've got to help them realize that getting functional bits first then leads to efficient. They can't write efficient code if they've never seen it. We can't expect elegance in code unless we demonstrate it. And I don't know at the moment whether I'm able to do that in Python yet. I don't know that I've got the skills yet. Um, realize and rel revel in efficiency. I like the notion of, I've got a solution. Is it any good? Can I make it any better? How do I tell whether this is a better solution than that? Right? The last term there is going to take a little unpacking. Understand, worship, and abuse the abstraction. <laughs> Now, an abstraction for me is something along the lines of something like, say, a list. You understand how it works, you understand how to get stuff into a list, you understand where you can use lists in a program, and then you say, well, what else can I get it to do? What can I stuff into a list? Do I have to put the same sorts of things in a list? Well, in Python, no. Cool. So from a database perspective, you could create a list that was like a row of a table with mixed data types. And then you could make a list of lists and you have a table. And then you just use normal indexing to get to parts of the table and suddenly you've got a database without even using any SQL. That's cool. You can set up a list and repurpose it. You say, okay, now I want to store all of this stuff in that list. And the list item sort of type juggle. I don't know if that's the right term. Sort of just basically says, okay, I was an integer before and now I'm this weird, wonderful, complex object and everything is cool. It doesn't whinge at you. I'm not afraid of that question. The how do I do something? Oftentimes I'll say, I don't know. But the most powerful answer I have found is, let's see if we can find out together. And certainly from a programming perspective, that's been my philosophy. I look back down at things I don't understand and don't wrestle with, and I often do that in front of kids now. I'll often wrestle with a problem live Seeing an adult wrestle with a problem helps the kids understand this is a problem-solving strategy. How did he go about that? He had no idea how it worked in the first place. He came up with a solution, realized that's not very good, but we can do better, and came up with another iteration, and often do that in class. 
And that's where I want to end. The I don't know, but let's see if we can find out together, because there's a whole lot to learn, and hopefully Python will give us opportunities to do that. Thank you. <clears throat>